Shalom. We are continuing with the Gospel according to John. We are investigating the Hebraic background. How would the Jews of the first century have understood the events that John described? Beginning in chapter 3, verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Yeshua by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Yeshua answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Yeshua answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Nicodemus comes to him at night because he's sneaking around. He doesn't want to be caught with Yeshua. He says, We know. So presumably there are other people with him, perhaps in the Sanhedrin, who are taking note of what's going on and are having to acknowledge that Yeshua has come from God by virtue of the miracles. We imagine that the concept of being born again is new. However, it's very clear, and it will be clear later on, that Yeshua expects him to understand what it means. And there are prior interpretations by certain rabbinical sources that show what it means to be born again. Yeshua is about to take him on a journey explaining the sequence of earthly things and of heavenly things. First, in the scriptures we see that, that people are born in sin. Job 14.4 Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Not one. And as David wrote in Psalm 51, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. This is in contrast to current Jewish belief that people are born with two inclinations, a good inclination and an evil inclination, and it is up to the human being to make a decision to live according to the good inclination. It doesn't take much experience in life to know that we need more power from the Holy Spirit than what we have in our own natural resources to fight the nature of original sin, which we have inherited from the first man, Adam. So there appears several places, the concept of someone who is like a child newly born. In Yivamot 48b, Rabbi Yossi said, One who has become a proselyte is like a child newly born. All his previous sins are forgiven. In Yivamot 62a, Resh Lakish, however, said, he has a firstborn son in respect of inheritance. This is irrelevant to the point that we're making here. He's commenting on something. But as, as he continues, he expresses the same thought. For a man who became a proselyte is like a child newly born. In Genesis 2.7, it says, And Yahweh God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living soul. Paul gives his commentary on this in 1 Corinthians 15, 45 through 49. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of earth, earthy. The second is from the Lord, from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as long as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Yeshua is going to speak of this to Nicodemus within the framework of being born again shortly. In Genesis Rabbah 39.11, it is giving a commentary on Genesis 12.2. Rav Barachaya said, It is not written, and I will give thee, or 
and I will send thee, but I will make thee, that is, after I have created thee as a new creation that will be fruitful and multiply, Yahweh talking to Abraham. They comment that this idea of being a new creation may refer either to his circumcision or to his change of name to Abraham from Avram, through both of which he may have been regarded as a new creation. So the concept of being a new creation in God, of a person who is already existing as a physical human being, is documented in early rabbinical opinion. In Vayikra, about 30, it is written, For the Holy One, blessed be He, will create them a new creature. Yalkut on Judges 6.1 Whoever has a miracle and praises God for it, his sins are forgiven, and he is a new creature. The idea of being born of water, sometimes we associate it with the physical birth, but it can also be participating in the mikvah, in the ritual immersion. We talked earlier about John's baptism. This is especially essential for Gentile converts because women cannot be circumcised and every man is born of natural water. Ezekiel 36, 25-27 Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. So being sprinkled with clean water results in a new birth. What does it mean to enter the kingdom of God? It is also called the kingdom of heaven. Traditional Jews do not pronounce the four-letter name of God. In Berachot 13a, Rabbi Joshua ben Korcha said, Why was a section of here placed before that of, and it shall come to pass? He's talking about the Shema and the other scriptures that go with it, which are Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, Deuteronomy 11, 13 through 21, and also Numbers 15, 37 through 41. These are the scriptures that are written inside the tefillin boxes. So why does the here of Deuteronomy 6 come before and it shall come to pass of Deuteronomy 11? So that one should first accept upon himself the yoke of the kingdom of heaven and then take upon himself the yoke of the commandments. This is always true. The covenant comes before the instructions for living. The Shema proclaims the kingdom of God expanded to wash hands, which is not included in any of these scriptures, to put on tefillin, which is the interpretation, binding them upon your hand as a front lip between your eyes, and reciting the Shema. The Shema declares the rule of God. It is a personal acknowledgement of, of accepting the yoke of Torah. Jewish thought is that this brings the second birth. And Yeshua said the second birth brings the entrance to the kingdom. Continuing in the text in chapter 3, verse 6, That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Yeshua answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So Yeshua brings him around to say, look, these things come first, they're the earthly things, and then these things come second, these are the heavenly things. And this is what I'm trying to explain to you, Nicodemus. You see, he does expect him to understand it. Yeshua expects Nicodemus to understand these things because he is the teacher of Israel. In bringing up the person of Moses, 
Yeshua is going to be drawing a lot of parallels. So these are some of the more important patterns of Moses where he foreshadows things that will happen to Yeshua. The, there's the ascending and descending. So we see Moses going up the mountain to get the commandments coming down and then going back up to get them again and coming down. Uh, and we will have the scriptures also for Yeshua going up and down. He came from heaven, he came down, he went back to heaven, and he'll be back. Uh, Moses was a legislator. Yeshua gave the law. Moses chose 70, which became eventually a Sanhedrin, the concept of Sanhedrin. And so Yeshua chose 70 apostles. They both fed people in the wilderness. We see Moses' face shining as a result of being in the presence of Yehovah and the transfiguration of Yeshua. Fasting for 40 days, both had power over the sea, both cleansing lepers. Moses, remember, prayed for Miriam to be healed. They both changed the name of their second in command. Moses changed the name of Hosea to Joshua in Numbers. And we see also that Yeshua changed Peter's name. And finally, we get to this example about lifting the snake on the pole, and we'll talk about that. So here are the patterns of ascending and descending. In Proverbs 30, verse 4, Who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fists? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is his son's name, if you can tell? In Psalms 47, 5, God has gone up with a shout, Yahweh with the sound of a trumpet. In Psalms 68, 18, Thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity captive, Thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that Yahweh God might dwell among them. Paul's exegesis on this verse appears in Ephesians 4, 8-10. Wherefore, he said, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended, first into the lower parts of earth, he descended, is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things, applying the verse in Psalms to Yeshua. In the incident of the serpent on the pole, in Numbers 21, Yahweh sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against Yahweh and against thee. Pray unto Yahweh that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass, that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it on a pole. And it came to pass, that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now this presents an interesting situation, in that the cure resembles the disease. There is a story concerning Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, the three Hebrew boys in the furnace, that the prince of hail came before the throne of God and said, I will go and I will rain down hail on the fire and that will extinguish the fire and thus they might be saved. However, the prince of the fire came before God and said, God's power is not to be demonstrated thus, for thou art the prince of hail, and everybody knows that water quenches fire. But I, the prince of fire, will go, will go down and cool the flame within and intensify it without, so as to consume the executioners, and thus I will perform a miracle within a miracle. Then the Holy One, blessed be he, said to him, Go down. So it's the same idea that the fire... Is going to put out the fire, just like looking at the serpent is going to cure the bites of the serpent. And so comes a saying, Thou shalt remove the mischief by that which did the mischief, and thou shalt heal the disease by that which made thee sick, which is quoted in Lightfoot. So as Yeshua is bringing to Nicodemus' example of the serpent on the pole and the cure being similar to the disease, this is already concept within the oral traditions of the Jews that he might have recognized that Shua 
being the last man is like the first man, but he is the cure for the disease. Continuing in the text in verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be proved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought in God. The first expression of love in the Torah is in Genesis 22. 2. During the Akedah, which is the binding of Isaac, and he said, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. This story has so many applications to the life of Yeshua. The fact that he is the only begotten son, even though Isaac was not the only son of Abraham, but as God describes it, he says, this is your only son and that you love him. And now we see that God has one son and that God loves him and God's going to offer him up. So just the great imagery, the foreshadowing of the sacrifice of Yeshua. And in verse 16, and said, by myself have I sworn, saith Yahweh, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son. Paul comments in Romans 8.32, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Continuing in verse 22 of chapter 3, book of John, After these things came Yeshua and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. And John also was baptizing in Anon near Salim, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized, for John was not yet cast into prison. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto the Jordan and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond the Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Messiah, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. So it seems like the authorities are kind of trying to stir John up and cause some rift between, uh, between him and Yeshua. They're trying to m make him jealous by pitting him against Yeshua. But he is sure of his purpose, and he calls himself the friend of the bridegroom. Paul also calls himself the friend of the bridegroom. In 2 Corinthians 11.21, I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Messiah. Moses can also be seen in this role, Exodus 19.17. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the nether part of the mount, while Yahweh, as the bridegroom, meets his assembly at Sinai. Maimonides writes, it is the prevailing custom in all lands that when a man gets married, his comrades and acquaintances send him money in order to help him defray the expenses connected to the marriage. Those same friends and acquaintances who send him gifts are then entitled to come, eat and drink with the groom during the week of the wedding festivities. Those who send the money or gifts are referred to as shoshbin. We have seen that a 
in accepting the honor of being a shoshbin, a person is also assuming a financial obligation, since the best man was expected to confer generous gifts upon the groom. In the short term, some of the expense could be written off against the pleasures of being invited to wine and dine at the wedding festivities. However, it was of greater significance that the shoshbin could count on recouping his capital more completely on the occasion of his own marriage. The Mishnah rules that the obligation to repay the wedding presents is enforceable by law. If the favor were not returned when the best man himself got married, he was entitled to sue for the original cost. Jewish law, therefore, had to adjudicate cases in which the weddings of the two comrades were of unequal cost. And the rabbis discussed whether the obligation to recompense the wedding presents could be inherited if the original shoshman died before ever collecting it. Indeed, the bride was also expected to have her own shoshbin to support and attend her through the wedding. So the person in this role is introducing the bride to the groom. They are walking with them through the courtship, through the time of the ceremony. There are financial obligations to support each other. And even after children are born, the shoshbin is still sometimes uh, under obligation to bring the child to the synagogue for perhaps the brit milah, for the circumcision or naming ceremony, it carries a lot of responsibility. So John places himself in that position. He is introducing the bride to the groom, and he's going to walk for his part through the courtship. Of course, he will be more than well paid back. The final verses of the chapter, He must increase, but I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. And what he hath seen and heard, that he testifieth, and no man receiveth his testimony. He that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth in him. So again, he takes us through th this pattern of what is first earthly and what is second heavenly. Again, he tells us that the Father loves the Son, and the Son is going to inherit all things. The fact that that John says that Yeshua must increase and he himself must decrease, foreshadows this idea that he, will, he is going to lose his life. And it is a bit reminiscent of the changing of the guard when Aaron dies. In Numbers 20, verses 24 through 28, Aaron shall be gathered unto his people, for he shall not enter into the land which I have given unto the children of Israel, because ye rebelled against my word at the water of Merivah. Take Aaron and Eliezer his son, and bring them up into Mount Hor, and strip Aaron of his garments, and put them on Eliezer his son. And Aaron shall be gathered unto his people, and shall die there. And Moses did as Yahweh commanded, and they went up into Mount Hor in the sight of all the congregation. And Moses stripped Aaron of his garments, and put them upon Eliezer his son. And Aaron died there in the top of the mount, and Moses and Eliezer came down from the mount. So we have this picture of the changing of the guard. Again, John is talking about those who have witnessed, and those who have believed, and those who have not believed. In Isaiah 53.1, it is written, Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of Yahweh revealed? It almost speaks of two different people. There's a people group to whom the arm of Yahweh, that is Yeshua, was revealed. But then it seems like there is another group of people, a different group, who actually were, believed the report of the Lord. Yes, some overlap, but maybe two different groups. Until next time, Tasimita Inayim, Al Hashemayim, keep your eye on the sky, your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom.